I'm Hart from Across Protocol. Uh, I'm here to talk about Intense. Um, people in this audience might understand Intense well, uh, but I think a lot of people don't. And at this conference, uh, there's a few people that have come up to me and been like, hey, I'm finally beginning to get this Intense thing. And I'm specifically gonna focus on cross-chain Intense, uh, what that means, what that looks like. And my goal or thrust here is to try to pill you on why this architecture uh, is important for interop uh, and why I think it's the, the best, quote unquote, best architecture for most use cases of uh, what we need to do to connect blockchains. Okay, so what we want, um, and I think everyone generally agrees with this, is we want cheap, fast, and secure interop that is so seamless you don't know you're dealing with blockchains. Uh, the you don't know you're dealing with blockchains part is called chain abstraction. People like talking about chain abstraction right now. I think that's great. Uh, but here, the general point is we want to connect uh, this modular ecosystem. We're here at Modular Summit. How do we connect the modular ecosystem so that it feels like one unified platform? Users just click buttons and do things. That is the goal. And um, I think the problem here is most people think interoperability looks something like TCP IP. You have a bunch of servers, and you want to connect them with pipes and send messages between them. And uh, this is how the internet works, so it makes sense that this is how we'd connect blockchains. Um, and I actually think this is a misnomer. This is what gets us in trouble. Um, if you think about this kind of naive version, Let's see if I can use the pointer thing. Yeah, OK. So I have blockchain A, blockchain B. I want to send value or do send money, send an asset, send one ETH between A and B. Let's just send a message, right? That seems easy. Makes sense. Um, but there's some problems with this. Problem is blockchain has some sense of finality on blockchain A. So I can't really send this message until I achieve some sense of finality on blockchain A. And then sending a message between blockchains while being secure is hard. Uh, I have to be fast, cheap, and secure all at the same time. That's an extremely difficult thing to do. There's a lot of um, uh, you know, three-way pyramid things about why that's hard um, to, to, make, to make happen. So yeah. This is a hard thing to do. And basically, if we go back here, we got time for finality, time to send message that's slow, and it's probably expensive, and it might be insecure. So the solution here is, very simply, let's just stop sending messages, at least not in real time. And um, this is where the intense concept, the cross-chain intense concept really comes in. The core observation that I think we've made is in the internet, in TCIP, you're moving bytes, you're moving messages, you're moving data. But for 98% of blockchain use cases today, when we are connecting between blockchains, what we really care about is moving value. And I say mostly, because there are use cases where I need to move messages, we can maybe talk about that later, but most of the time I'm just moving value, I'm bridging, I'm swapping, and maybe I'm calling. So on the destination chain, maybe I'm, I'm doing some action. And that, that further extends to this concept that, OK, value is fungible. If I'm a user, I don't care how, like, which dollars got to the destination blockchain. I just want dollars. They're the same. And I think this is like the core insight that unlocks in this cross-chain intense concept. I don't care how the money got there. I don't care which money it is. I just care about it being there. And uh, I think this is our mental model for why we think cross-chain intents work so well. So we'll, we'll redo this, uh, this bridging concept where I want to move value from blockchain A to blockchain B, but we're going to not send messages. So no message sent. Instead, we introduce a third party. We're going to call them solvers. Uh, in a cross, we call them relayers or fillers. Some people call them market makers. All the same concept. It's a third party that is going to observe the user's deposit transaction on blockchain A and then going to fill them with their own capital on blockchain B. And the, the core trade-off here is with their own capital, which we'll go into. 
So the solver fills them with blockchain B, and they can fill them extremely quickly. If this solver trusts, say, a pre-confirmation from a centralized sequencer or decentralized sequencer, whatever it might be, if they trust what blockchain A is telling them, these solvers can take risk with their own capital to fill the user near instantly. Um, and the fun thing I could do if we had a computer and I could do demos, I could give you guys a demo of this. Uh, our, our median fill time L2 to L2 on a cross is about four seconds right now. Uh, when we're going from Arbitrum to base or optimism, it's about a one or two second fill time. It's extremely quick because we have a solver network that is trusting the Arbitrum sequencer here. Um, but they're trusting it with their own risk capital. It's not the user's money that's at risk here. And they're giving an extremely fast fill, which we'll get into more. Okay, so idea here. With cross-chain intents, solvers are using their own capital. I'm repeating myself here. Solvers are using their own capital uh, to quickly and cheaply fill users, and then they get repaid later. So, okay, we'll zoom out a sec second here. This is what the across view of what cross-chain intents looks like. Uh, this view is shared by a lot of other people in our ecosystem. Uh, the Frontier Research guys, the Cake framework looks like this. Uh, what Socket's doing with their um, MoFo framework looks like this too. Uh, a bunch of people are kind of independently coming to a similar looking uh, architecture where we have three layers. We have the intent layer, where what the user wants to do is created. This you can think of as the application. Uh, user says, I want to move A to B, um, or maybe it's move A to B and do a deposit function, or buy an NFT, or execute some bit of code. We have the solver layer that is competing to fill that intent. And we have the settlement layer. The settlement layer here is going to escrow user funds uh, on the destination chain and not release them to the solver until we verify the intent was repaid. So the general order flow here, intent gets created, solver, uh, user funds get escrowed, solver fills user extremely quickly with their own capital, then wait, delay, verify the intent was filled, release user funds from escrow back to solver. Um, okay, so I want to walk through just sort of why I think this architecture works well and what the trade-offs are. Um, so intents, I said before, they can be really, really fast. Um, this is data from our own internal systems uh, where we're looking at uh, L1 to L2 bridge times, L2 to L1, and L2 to L2. And across, we really do have a median fill time of about four seconds. Uh, the 90th percentile fill time is under 10 seconds now, um, and we're pushing hard to get this down. What's cool about this is we don't really do anything. We just incentivize solver competition, um, and the solvers themselves are the ones that are competing to fill users faster. Um, as some of you may know, I sometimes war with Stargate on Twitter. Um, this is our data, not Stargate's data, but this is our data that you can verify yourselves on Stargate v2. Um, they're a lot slower because their general framework is this let's send a message from A to B and they have to wait for a sense of finality. It's, it's a different architecture. It has some trade-offs, but it's certainly not as fast. And uh, for comparison here, I also included uh, Circle CCTP protocol, which I think is very cool, very useful, and is actually integrated with a cross under the surface. But the way Circle wait works is if they're going to uh, burn and mint USDC, they need absolute certainty around finality guarantees. So Circle will wait for full finality of the, uh, the L2 checkpoint to be finalized by Ethereum. It means it's going to take them about 20 minutes to, to bridge uh, transactions. And that's, that's something that they're not going to change because that finality guarantee matters so much to them. Uh, da -da. Okay, so too much text on this slide, um, but the high level context here is I think intents can be extremely secure. And the observation here is that we are separating the urgent part, that the user wants a fast fill, from the complex part, which is how do we verify that fill uh, did happen? How do we send messages between blockchains? 
And by separating these two things, the, the complex part we can take our time on, which buys us more advantages for how we would actually verify or send messages between blockchains. And um, we, we have the, in this intense framework, it's not wed to any one messaging technique for how we would verify intents. Uh, we can do what we want here. Um, uh, and different architectures are gonna use different mechanisms. Um, you could imagine verifying fills using canonical bridges. This is somewhat how a cross works today. Um, we kind of use a combination of an optimistic system to verify a batch of, of, uh, of solver fills, and then we use canonical bridges to move that message from Ethereum mainnet to the different chains that, that we support. Um, but you can also imagine that we use ZK proofs to do this. You can imagine we use native interop. So when you see the Optimism superchain building native interop, could we use the native interop that Optimism has to verify intents and repay solvers more quickly and more securely? Yes, definitely. Polygon egg layer, all the above. We can use these systems uh, kind of abstract them into this intense framework uh, to enable more secure relayer repayment. And um, intents can be really cheap. And this one is, is a little, it takes a little more nuance to think through how this happens. But um, the reasons why we can be really cheap with this architecture involve batching and um, uh, using messaging techniques that are extremely secure but cheap. So basically in the trade-off spectrum of sending messages that are cheap, secure, and fast, we can give up on fast and focus on cheap and secure. Um, this is data, again, from our own internal systems. Um, we're not always the cheapest. Uh, to be fair to my friends at Stargate, sometimes some of their bus stuff can be extremely cheap, but it takes about three minutes versus four seconds. And so there are trade-offs here in our architecture, and we are gunning towards this idea of uh, speed matters more than very, very marginal price improvements. Okay. Um, so why can intents be cheap? Um, I'll keep this as like a high-level kind of conceptual example. But let's imagine we're bridging $50 million in volume over 50,000 transactions. Um, let's assume that both bridges, uh, both the kind of messaging architecture and the intense architecture have the same gas costs for deposit and fill transactions, which is like approximately true. Um, what's the difference between doing this batched verification of intents versus sending a message for each bridge fill? And the trade-off here on the intense architecture is that solvers are making loans with their own capital. There is a cost of capital for a solver to fill a user with their own capital and get repaid later. And as an example, if I'm loaning 50, oops, sorry. If I'm loaning $50 million uh, for an hour at a 10% interest rate, that's 500 bucks for an hour. Um, and if I can batch together my hour's worth of solver repayments, I can then verify these 50,000 intents for like 10 messages. I'm putting a hypothetical cost here of a dollar, but it's some fixed cost that's low. And so your main cost is the cost of this loan. But you compare this to if I'm gonna send 50,000 messages, I'm actually saying these messages are super cheap. I'm putting them at 10 cents a message. But sending 50,000 messages is extremely expensive um, relative to sending far fewer. And I think this is the other insight that I don't know people have totally grokked yet. I look at this intense architecture as a compression of messaging. So in this example, 50,000 cross-chain actions are compressed into 10 messages to verify those 50,000 actions versus 50,000 cross-chain actions, 50,000 messages. And in my view, this compression gives us extreme cost and security advantages. We can then send fewer messages. They could be more expensive, but still in aggregate cheaper, and they can be much more secure. So I think this is the, an underlooked aspect of why this cross-chain intense architecture can work so well. 
Okay. Um, so there's uh, here's a concept, or, or just a slide of in jumper, Leafy's jumper. A cross can actually be significantly faster and even cheaper than Circle CCTP, which is Circle's native bridge. And like, how is that possible? Um, this isn't possible at huge values. If you're bridging a million dollars of USDC, you should use CCTP if you want to minimize costs. But um, for small sizes, we're actually so gas efficient, this architecture can be so gas efficient on its deposits and fills that we can actually be cheaper than what Circle costs for bridging modest amounts of USDC. And we can, of course, do this far faster, given that solvers are fronting this capital and filling users quickly. So what's the TLDR here? Um, we look at a cross as this settlement layer for cross-chain intents. Um, I believe this architecture can scale to transfer billions uh, of dollars a day of value while sending very few messages. This is this message compression idea. Um, Non-intent-based designs, designs that are sort of messaging-centric, need to send a lot of messages if they're going to send a lot of value between blockchains. And my observations, just intuitively, that feels expensive. That feels like something that's going to cost a lot. Um, OK, so our vision. Um, at the intent layer, we want to cross. And we increasingly, uh, I'm going to go into a second in the standard for cross-chain intents that we've uh, been developing. Um, but we want to cross to promote this intent-centric architecture where we help aggregators, dApps, wallets, protocols like Skip um, create and root intents uh, through our, a solver network. We want to help develop uh, a solver network that is not specific to a cross. We think this solver network needs to be um, generic. I don't want to say a public good, but it needs to be accessible to many applications that can all benefit from a positive sum, like a not zero sum uh, uh, advantage of increased liquidity at the solver layer. And so we're working to help establish a standard for cross-chain intents that I'm going to get into. And um, lastly, there's this settlement layer where across what we are trying to do here is define a best-in-class settlement layer that will escrow user funds uh, and release them to the solver after we verify the intent was filled. OK. So, yep, we've sort of, in the course of this year, we've relaunched across uh, V3 as a settlement system for cross-chain intents. And um, we've been working hard uh, with Uniswap, and Uniswap X's cross-chain design in many ways uh, mirrors or uh, has many similarities to what we're doing. We've worked with Uniswap to develop a standard for cross-chain intents. Uh, it's been assigned the ERC number 7683. Um, and you guys should go check out erc7683.org. We are actively looking for feedback on this standard. This is still being developed. Um, but we want this to be an open standard that has no concept of vendor lock-in. Uh, we want this to be a standard that helps define a common layer of abstraction for how intents can work. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll go back here for a second. There's a slide that I didn't quite have time to make before I had to send these in. Um, and it goes to sort of think through how we create a unified Ethereum in a world where we have more and more types of ecosystem interop. So uh, I wish I had a visual for this, but you can kind of imagine um, we have the Optimism Superchain that is working on their version of native interop to connect superchain chains. We have Polygon AgLayer that's working on their version of native interop to connect AgLayer chains. We have ZK Sync doing the same thing with Elastic Chain. Uh, Arbitrum Orbit, a little bit less clear what they're going to do here now. But they've got some cool stuff coming out, but they're going to connect their own chains too. And so you kind of have, if you zoom out, you've got four ecosystems that are building their own versions of interop that might work pretty well. Um, they might not still be that fast. I actually think most of these technologies are not going to be two second fill times, which is what we're aiming for. Um, but there, there's now this kind of uh, fragmentation around how ecosystems in Ethereum might communicate. 
And I'm not even including Cosmos and Solana and all this other Altel ones. And now from, um, like from just Ethereum's perspective, there's something very cool about fostering this experimentation and this innovation within these different ecosystems. But now you have this splintered and fragmented world. And uh, I don't think that's very good. We want like a unified Ethereum experience. And I think this standard, this uh, thinking of, a, of, of an intent, a cross-chain intent, as a very thin, very lightweight layer of abstraction that specifies how a user can move assets from A to B and maybe execute some code on chain B, it becomes a unifying layer that helps connect these native interop ecosystems with a common standard. And if your intent happened to be, let's say, for example, between two Optimism super chains, well, then it would just be better. It would just be cheaper. It would be just as fast, but it would be cheaper because the uh, intent protocol would be able to repay the solver uh, more quickly, uh, more cheaply, using the native interop that the super chain offers. Um, OK, so we've, I'm going to run out of time here, but we're bringing intents to some new chains. Um, we are also at this concept of a cross plus where it's just using the same ERC-76 intent standard but allows you to execute code on the destination chain so you could bridge and buy an NFT or bridge and deposit into, um, uh, into Aave or Morpho. Um, and the only other thing that I wanted to show you guys because I think this is super cool, Den Kuhn has changed the game. Den Kuhn lo lowered costs by so much that what we actually saw is the median size of uh, an L2 to L2 bridge transaction was like 500 bucks before, on like literally before March 15th when Denkun came out, and it's dropped by a full order of magnitude. So the median L2 to L2 bridge size is now 50 bucks. We actually have consumer applications, people using L2s to do real things, which I think is super cool. Um, okay. That's me, Hal2001 on Twitter. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it.